10 steps to a 6, how to DBQ, sample number 1. So I was grading some of your work Sunday. I stopped on the second one. We need to review. You guys are still doing pretty good considering it's our first one. But I want to review the basics with you. I talked to Chris Peak via the book face, and he gave me permission to put his DBQ in video form online since we're in a hybrid format due to COVID and, you know, whatever. He was cool about it. We all have this book. You should have this book at home. Use my step-by-step -step guide. The best one so far I've seen, guess what the kid did? He used the guide. Very simple. I'm taking hours and hours and hours of training and reading and research and watching videos, talking to other AP teachers, talking to college board people. I'm taking all that stuff and I'm squashing it down to one piece of paper to make your life easier. But if you don't use it, it's not much good. So you got to use it. Read and understand the prompt. Here's the prompt. Evaluate the extent to which increasing interactions among societies during the period 1200 to 1550 contributed to diffusion. If you don't know what diffusion means, you're in trouble. A lot of students in multiple subjects, when they get a question wrong on a test, research has shown it's not that they couldn't you know, do the critical thinking necessary to answer the question. It was an issue of vocabulary. There was something in the question, or in this case, the prompt. There was a word. They didn't know what it meant. If you don't know what diffusion means, you could be in trouble. It's just spreading something more widely, right? The reason why I say read and understand the prompt, a very common mistake, you get away from the prompt, especially when you're under a timer. You just start writing stuff. Next thing you know, you're just puking out facts. It's not relevant to the prompt. Remember my sample. If somebody breaks in my house, I grab my gun, I shoot him, I kill him, I go to court. My lawyer better be talking about self-defense all day long, telling that jury that I acted in self-defense, I have a legally registered weapon, I have no criminal record, I was in my home, guy was walking towards me and my wife, self-defense all day. If my lawyer starts talking about, you know, Mr. Cruz, uh, He's won three rib contests here in Detroit. He's got a, you know, he likes to do competition barbecue. Me and everybody in the courtroom are going to be like, dude, what are you talking about? That has, it's true. I, I like the barbecue. I've won a few contests. Has nothing to do with the case. That's what it feels like when I read some of your essays. You're writing stuff, but it has nothing to do with the prompt. And what you're writing can be true. It's historically accurate. But it has nothing to do with the prompt. No points for you. They're going to ignore that. So make sure you stay focused on the prompt. The templates I've made for you. If you just follow the templates, it does it for you. Okay. You don't want to waste time reading these documents over and over again, which is what's going to happen, especially when you're under a timer. Underline what you need. Get out. Move on to the next one. Somebody asked in class yesterday. Well, how do I know what I need? Excellent question. The prompt tells you. So going by the prompt, think of it when you go to the grocery store, you guys go to e &L and your mom or dad give you a list. You get what's on the list. You don't go up and down every aisle. I'm going to look at every single item they have. You're going to be there all day. You got your list. The prompt is your list. Take what you want. Take what you need and get out. So you got your list. The prompt is your list. Take what you need. I'm underlining what in this document can help me support my claim, support my argument. Like my lawyer in court, if I'm there in there for self-defense, everything he's talking about should be geared towards proving that I acted in self-defense and I shouldn't go to prison. Right? I don't want my lawyer talking about, you know, Mr. Cruz, he, one of his favorite movies is The Godfather. What the heck are you talking about? It's true. I like the Godfather. Guess what? Has nothing to do with the case. It's irrelevant. So don't be, you know, don't be that guy. Don't start drifting and talking about stuff that may be true but has nothing to do with the prompt. 
Take what you need. How do you know what you need? Look at the prompt. The prompt tells you what to underline. So I'm not going to read you the whole document. You got it in your book. So if you want, you can just pause it. Or just look in your book. If you're, if you're at home and you left your book at school, pause it and read the document. And I just leave a little note to myself. You can write this somewhere. The point of this is for quick reference. So when I'm writing the essay, and in my head I'm going, uh, what was that one where Hungarians knew Latin or something? I need that one. Where's that one? Was that document five? Was it document three? I forgot. And you start rereading it. Or if it's not underlined, you're like, where was it? There was something about Hungarians. They learned the language. Oh, man, I forgot. And you, next thing you know, you've read this document three, four times. You're dead in the water. You're done. Too much time. You don't want to do that. Now, document two is either it's either the easiest document in the bunch or it's the most difficult. It's a calligrapher, right? This is visual. Japanese Buddhism. You have to infer. You have to have some prior knowledge. How can you use this? Well, looking at the prompt, what's the prompt right here? Diffusion among societies. Japanese Buddhism, boom, that nails it. I can use this for the prompt all day. Because I know, and you should know, that Buddhism began, originated in India. So the fact that this is in Japan and it's becoming popular, that is an example of diffusion, right? This document, I'm taking what I need, underline it. How do I know what I need? The prompt tells me what can support my argument. Think about my lawyer. What's everything he can come up with that proves I acted in self-defense? Don't be telling people that, you know, I graduated from whatever, you know, whatever colleges I graduated from. It's, it's irrelevant. Stick to the point. Self-defense, keep me out of prison. Underlining this, leave myself a little note. For reference, I move on. Underline, take what I need. Document four, what do I need? The prompt will tell me. Note to myself, I have a quick reference when I'm writing my essay. I'm done. I move on. Underline what I need in document five. I move on after I leave a little note to myself. Document number six, I underline what I need. Again, the prompt tells me what I need. Leave myself a little note. I'm setting myself up. I'm rolling. Document seven. I'm already thinking in my mind, this is the however document. This is the one I'd probably use to go after the unicorn point, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm already thinking in my mind, man, I just need one more excuse to get rid of this document. Save me a ton of time. Step three, and again, all this is, is your step-by-step -step guide. One piece of paper. I did all the work for you. I did all the heavy lifting. Just follow the guide. As you get better at this, you can get away from the guide a little bit. Think of the guide as like your training wheels. So I'm going to bucket my documents. You used to get a grouping point or something. They don't do that anymore. But you still want to bucket them to organize your essay. There's different ways to bucket it. So like the way I bucket it, I really don't like the way I bucketed this one, really. I think if I were to put a little more thought into it, I think I would have bucketed this differently. But I'm okay. It doesn't really matter. Like you could bucket this different. The only thing that really matters is don't don't put the same document in more than one bucket. Once you bucket a document, it's done. You can move it if you want. Like yeah, you know what I'm gonna put over here. But once once you start writing, you don't want document one in bucket one and bucket three. You're gonna have problems. You're gonna waste a lot of time. All right. This is just the way I felt like bucketing this at the time. This one's a little weird the way I did it. I think I got lazy. But number one, they all have to do something with China. So I put all four of them in bucket one. Bucket two, it was talking about religion spreading. But neither one of them had anything. It wasn't in China. So I think it was Japan and Syria. So because they're not China, I put those in bucket two. Bucket three, I only have one document. Uh, the Russian one with Ivan the Terrible, Russian isolationism. This is my however document. 
I'm already I'm looking for an excuse just to dump document seven and not even use it. Step four, write your thesis. This is like the bread and butter of your DBQ essay. You want a good thesis, you want a strong thesis. If you follow the template, you're gonna have a strong thesis. Now you might see in some of the stuff I've given you, I put specific historical examples such as and then rule of three use that at first but then you can get away from it especially if like i think i'm going to have a really long sentence so i'm going to i'm going to dump that part i'm going to have rule three proves that my stand my claim my argument because the word because just copy it and then just tie it back to the prompt how do you do that i'm going to show you um, make sure your thesis passes the T-shape three test, right? Take a stand, be specific, write a historically defensible claim. You're doing that when you use the documents. If you look at the documents, like they're little Wikipedias and you are about to plagiarize and you don't want to get busted for plagiarism. You're not going to quote, you're not going to copy, but you're going to take info from that document. And you're just going to use it and put your own spin on it. Use your own words. Prove to your reader that you read the document without just copying it, right? Just think of you're using Wikipedia. You don't want to get busted for plagiarism. You guys do this. The skills you need to do this, you, you, you kind of already do it when, you, when uh, you're when you trying to avoid getting busted for plagiarism. You know, answer the prompt. Sounds like common sense, but when you're rushed under a timer, it's easy to get away from the prompt. Next thing you know, you're talking about the frickin' Cuban Missile Crisis. You're way off base. Um, rule of three, chicken foot. You want three specific historical pieces of evidence from the documents. Rule of three, chicken foot. They like to see that. And talking to some college board people, the thesis has gotten easier to get the. It's gotten easier to get the point in the last couple of years. It's easier to get the thesis point now than it was two years ago from what I've been told. Do's and don'ts. Respond directly to all parts of the prompt. Make sure your thesis is arguing the prompt. Use a historically defensible claim. Establish a line of reasoning. A lot of kids have trouble. What does that mean? Just use the word because and therefore, and it does it for you. Be specific. Don't be vague. Address all parts of the prompt, like the prompt we have now. Don't forget about the word extent, a, a huge problem. And this is a word College Board likes, extent. The prompt isn't asking you if there's diffusion. There is. It's asking you what extent. Some of your essays, you're trying to show me that, yes, there is diffusion. Yes, there is diffusion. Look, here's an example. No, bro, that's not what it's asking you. To what extent? You never told me the extent. You gave me all these examples that there's diffusion. No, duh. Don't be Captain Obvious. That's not what it's asking you. We know there's diffusion. It's asking you... To what extent? That's what you need to be telling me. That's why some of you, you think you got a six, but when I give you your student audit and go over it with you, you got a four. And that's why for a lot of them. Um, use the word because at least once and use chicken foot. Here's the don'ts. Take a proactive approach, man. The stuff, This stuff here is like from Chris Peake's book that he wrote for the teachers. Stuff that I've read. You know, these are common mistakes. Don't restate the question. It's not your English class. Different class, different rules. Include items in your thesis that are never mentioned again in your essay. You don't want to do that. Don't generalize. Don't be vague. Don't just make stuff up, quote, or copy. Split your thesis into multiple spots through the essay. No good. That's a big no-no. You can write a second thesis. You could write a third thesis. You could write a fourth thesis. Why would you do that? It's just an insurance policy. Sometimes when you write a DBQ, especially if it's a topic you're not that strong, you don't know much about this topic, by the time you get done using the seven documents, you learn some stuff. You can also start to infer some things. You'll see a pattern and you'll be like, oh, I, I don't really know this topic that well, but I kind of see what's going on. Or sometimes what happens is later on, something clicks. A uh, illustrative example from the CED, uh, something from my lecture, something from Heimer's history video, something from AP Classroom. 
something clicks towards you and like, oh, okay, I, oh yeah. Or that could have helped me with my thesis or I kind of understand this more. In other words, sometimes by the time you're done, you're capable of writing a better thesis than you were 30 minutes ago. So if you can do that, or if you just have extra time, just write a second thesis at the end. That's step 10. You can't take points off. It's not your English class. If they don't like your second thesis, so what? They don't take points off. If they gave you the point in the first one, you're good. They'll just ignore the second one. It doesn't, you know, they don't hurt nothing. Um, you know, some college board members have said that's a pretty smooth move. If they didn't understand your first thesis, or for whatever reason you didn't get the point, and you got a second one, that's great insurance policy. And that's some of the things we can do because we're not going after the unicorn point. We can, and we really need to give ourselves some insurance. Okay, so I'm using my template. No big deal. Rule of three. Hungarians learning Latin and French, comma, Mongols practicing all four major religions, comma, and Buddhism spreading to Japan proves that, got that from my template, proves that, increasing interactions, where did I get that language from? In the prompt, this time contributed to the largest mass scale of diffusion the world had ever seen. So largest mass scale, <coughs> why am I saying that? Because I'm addressing the extent. Diffusion, that's what it's asking. It's right from the prompt. Is my thesis tied to the prompt? Heck yeah, it is. In the largest mass scale the world has ever seen, I'm addressing extent. I'm telling you this thing's huge, right? Then let's use the word because. Establish a Establish a line of reasoning. Gee, that sounds difficult. No, it's not. Just use the word because. You're good. You're money. Because trade also introduced disease and the spread of religion, causing permanent changes to society. Once again, I'm addressing the extent. I think I got a decent thesis here. I think I'm pretty good. Now, how do I know this? Hungarians learn Latin and French because I'm so smart and I read so many history books. No. You could know nothing about any of this. It comes right from the documents. It's like you're plagiarizing Wikipedia. I'm just using what's right in front of me. I can know nothing about this topic, and I can still write this thesis. I'm using these documents to argue, to uh, you know, make a claim, take a stand. All right, contextualization. Think Star Wars word crawl. Look at your step-by-step -step guide. Make sure you know this. If you don't know this, hit pause. Make sure you know it. Check your contextualization real quick before you give me your DBQ. What can you use to check it? Well, your thesis, you can use T-shape 3. For contextualization, use BAMs. Be specific. Address the prompt. Make a connection. Set up the thesis. Does your contextualization do that? College board likes to see you go back 100, 200 years. Okay, so here's what I have. Specific historical examples, such as, so I'm spelling it out. Look, I'm being specific. Silk being traded on the Silk Roads as far back as 130 BCE. I'm going way back. From China to Europe, demonstrate diffusion. Where did I get that word from? The prompt between different countries, continents, and societies, that's in the prompt, that would alter the course of world history. Altering the course of world history, I'm addressing extent. The Silk Roads became dangerous for traders, um, led to decline in volume. However, during the Mongol Empire, the largest land-based empire in history, the Silk Roads saw a resurgence going into the 13th century. So I'm moving along. <coughs> now I'm coming into the time period of the prompt. Think Star Wars word crawl. Yeah, because of the Mongol protection. Although trade was the main objective of the Silk Roads, the spread of religion and disease would make the biggest and longest lasting global impact. Global impact. Big, right? <coughs> Extent. Maritime empires such as Portugal would also contribute to diffusion. Tying it to the prompt. 
among societies. Societies is in the front. During the 15th century and beyond. <coughs> Excuse me. A large amount of diffusion. Once again, diffusion. Tying it to the prompt. During these centuries. Have given us the world we live in today. The extent is so massive. It's immeasurable. What, how more. You know. How, what more can I say? That's how big it was. It's so massive. It's immeasurable. It changes world history. I think that's pretty solid contextualization. Um, if that doesn't get the point, I'd really like to know why. Um, what I can't do is use any of this stuff again. All this stuff is off the table when I go for evidence beyond the document because there's no double dipping, right? No double dipping. You can't use the same thing you used in here and use it later in the essay for evidence beyond the document. <clears throat> so you might want to sandbag. If you don't know a lot about it, <clears throat> you might want to sandbag a little bit. Save some of this stuff. Save a couple bullets in the chamber, right? Okay, so here's what we have so far. There's the contextualization. There's a the thesis. Please make sure you underline your thesis. I like to have it <clears throat> standing by itself. <clears throat> so it really sticks out to my reader. It's not English class. You don't have to have paragraphs that meet, a, you know, you can have, it can be a mess from an English standpoint. The structure, they don't care. They're just looking for what they're looking for to give you the point. So I like to do this. So, man, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt where my thesis is. Step, step six, seven, and eight. <clears throat> We're going to do our buckets. If you hit every document with DHTT, you're going to be money. All seven documents, hit them with DHTT. That means you should end up with seven therefores, right? Use the hip sheet seven times. Even though you only need to hip at three, we're taking enough shortcuts, getting rid of the unicorn point, possibly dumping the document. Hip all six. If you just use six, hip all six. You can hip them in one sentence. Just in case they don't like some of the other ones. You want to have insurance. Say, yeah, you know what? I don't like this. If you do this in class, and some of you have done it, it's like, I'm not giving you a contextualization point. And you make a, you state a case. If you can convince me, I mean, you know what? Yeah, I understand what you're saying now. I kind of get it. Yeah, I'll give you the point. You made a good argument. You don't get to do that with the college board. We're over here. You're in Detroit. This dude's in Kansas City. You're never going to meet this guy. If he doesn't like it, he doesn't like it. So when you take multiple shots at these things, what you're doing is, I got you, buddy. Okay, you don't like that? Bam. I got another one. You don't like that one? Bam. I got a third one. Give me, give me my point. Right? That's the attitude you want to have. That's the strategy. So what's DHTT? Describe, hip sheet, therefore, tie back to the prompt, your stand. And if you can throw a because in there, that don't hurt nothing either. Put D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, D7 after you describe the document. Make it easy for them to grade it. Okay, so <clears throat> document one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's me using a template. Not necessarily in this order, but I'm using the template. Specific historical examples, such as, that's a good way to start. You can even start your thesis like that. Because I'm telling my reader exactly what he wants to see. He wants to see specific historical examples. Specific historical examples, such as <clears throat> Hungarians being able to speak Latin and French and interacting with Mongol rulers for decades. So I'm describing the document. I'm not quoting it. I'm not copying it. I'm proving that I read it, right? You're getting your evidence point. Proves that there were many interactions during this time period. I'm, what's this language I'm using? Interactions. It's in the prompt. Proves that. 
right? I'm tying it back. To put D1, so I'm talking about document one. The author believed that <clears throat> I'm simply copying a sentence stem off the hip sheet. Emperor Khan was about to convert to Christianity. That's my second shot at describing it. I only need one to stick for it to count. I did two. It's easy, it's fast, insurance policy. Therefore, <clears throat> I need my therefore. Proving that, so therefore proving, this is strong language. I'm making my claim. I'm taking a stand. Therefore proving, I'm establishing a line of reasoning. Therefore proving that the diffusion of Christianity was working. Where did I get diffusion from? The prompt was working and benefiting people around the world. This is me addressing the extent. In other words, I'm not going off on some tangent. I'm not saying, interacting with Mongol rulers. Hey, you know who was head of the Mongols was Chinggis Khan? Man, he was a bad dude. And I start going, Chinggis, Chinggis Khan this, Chinggis Khan that. Here's all the stuff I remember. It's not tied back to the prompt. It's not tied back to the thesis. It's not arguing the prompt. <clears throat> I just start writing a small biography on Chinggis Khan. And this is a common mistake. Because you get all excited because you know stuff about this guy. Hey, it's the Mongols. <clears throat> but it's not staying on point. It's not sticking with the argument. So you don't want to do that. Now, this just happened to pop in my head as I was writing this. So I might as well take a shot at evidence beyond the document. You can put your evidence beyond the document anywhere in the body paragraphs. I recommend taking three shots, two to three shots at evidence beyond the document. Just in case, you only need one to stick, just in case they don't like one. But this one, I wrote it, I liked it, I moved on. Then I didn't like it so much. So I'm really glad I did the second one. Another benefit of different societies sharing their religions with each other was increased trade. Many traders would convert to the religion of potential customers as a business decision. This commonly, this this commonality would open doors for them. So I'm throwing some evidence beyond the document. <clears throat> we learned that in the Amps Gold text, my lecture. I think Heimler's history talks about it. AP classroom. So something that popped in my head, I can use it. When I got away from it, I started getting worried. Like you know what, somebody might. You could maybe make an argument that's a little too general. But I'm like, I think. I think most readers would give me the point. There's going to be those that wouldn't. But I got something for them. I'm going to take a second shot a little later. Let me go back. Sorry. All right. <clears throat> so there is my original the document. Then document three, another specific historical example of diffusion. I see how I keep saying diffusion. Your English teacher might get on your case about that and lower your grade and take points off. And say, hey man, you need to find another way to say diffusion. This isn't an English paper. It's okay. I'm hitting them over the head with a hammer. I'm showing them that I'm addressing the prompt. I'm staying on point. A Franciscan friar being a welcome guest of the Grand Khan and building a church in Peking. Document 3. The Khan also allowed over 6,000 baptism. So I took two shots at sourcing document 3. I only need one. I just need to show them that I read it. <clears throat> therefore, using my template, therefore, proving, strong language, my argument, the interactions among societies was having a major impact. I'm addressing extent major impact on multiple cultures around the world. Tying it back to the prompt, tying it back to my thesis, supporting my argument, I'm staying on point. Then this one, for document three, I hit that in the very end. The author's intention was to show the Minister General how successful he has been in spreading Christi Christianity in China. So I hit it at the end. <clears throat> so document one, I hit it with DHTT. 
document three. I hit it with DHTT. I threw in an average on the document. I'm feeling pretty good about myself so far. The the evidence behind the documents bugging me a little bit right now. I think you know what I might have been a little vague. Okay, so I'm still in body paragraph number one. Now I'm using document four. <clears throat> Sometimes increasing interactions among societies was not beneficial for all, all parties. Tying it back to the prompt. A specific historical example of this is Syria, being cut off from direct trade with China by the Persians. I'm describing sourcing document four. The author's intention of this document was, using the hip sheet, to have written a record and accurate scholarship for encyclopedia. I source D4 again. Trade with Rome across the Indian Ocean was described. I'm using, I'm sourcing document four again. Therefore, providing further evidence that interactions among societies led to more and more opportunities for trade. Marco Polo clearly wanted to document the success of his interactions with other societies and show how they spread Christianity and benefited different cultures in different lands. Hip sheet. Polo described Mongol leader Kublai kissing the Bible and honoring Christianity, describing document 5. Kublai was also allowed the three other major religions to be honored and practiced under his rule. Therefore, following my template, proving that the diffusion, tying it back to the, thesis, uh, the prompt, of religions was on a large scale. Why am I emphasizing large scale? Because that's what they're asking me. What's the extent, bro? They don't want, you know, a biography on Chinggis Khan here. I'm addressing the extent. I think one of the... So here's my first body paragraph. There's a lot of work. That's the bad news. The good news, I'm almost done. This is like most of it. Let me get out of the way here. So just check that out. Pause. Read it. See how I'm doing it. See how I'm following the template. And this is like anything else. You got to practice. You can watch a thousand videos. At some point, you got to stop watching videos and just practice. That's how you're going to learn. You're going to make mistakes. So just dive in and start doing this on your own. Okay, so now I'm going to start body paragraph number two. Bucket number two. I only have two documents. And document two is just an illustration. This is easy. It's easy because I know that Buddhism began in India. If I don't know that, I'm looking at this thing like, what am I supposed to do with this, bro? I don't I don't even know what to do with this. How does this fit in anywhere? What is this telling me? If you don't know that Buddhism started in India, you probably want to dump this document. If you know Buddhism started in India, you love this document because it's so simple and easy. And you don't have to read much, right? So Buddhism became popular in China. In, I'm sorry, in Japan. Document two. I described it. Buddhism began in India circa 500 BCE and spread to Japan circa 6th century CE. This is my second shot at evidence behind the document. Popped in my head. Good place to put it. It's relevant. And do I remember the exact date of when Buddhism began? I don't know. But I do know. Remember I said this in class. You know, when Buddha is born, Jesus Christ is about 500 years later. And the prophet Muhammad is about 500 years after that. You know, we're starting all these world religions. So that's a good point of reference. I'm close, close enough. Um, the artist saw this. And then I was like, is a calligrapher an artist or is a calligrapher a writer? I wasn't really sure. I asked you guys to stay in class. You guys gave me a good answer. And it's kind of both. So, you know, probably splitting hairs. I'm probably okay calling a calligrapher an artist. The artist saw this as 
Um, actually, we should ask Miss Dickinson. That would be a good question to ask her. She could probably answer that better than I could. The artist saw this as a beautiful contribution to his culture. My second shot at describing from the interactions among societies, I'm showing how this goes back to my thesis and it addresses the prompt. Therefore, I got to use my therefore, proving that the diffusion of religion altered the course of many countries and changed in their history forever. So that's a short little document, and I'm good with that. You know, that was easy. Document six, my second and last document for bucket two. Here's my little note to myself. There's what I underlined. And not, you know, I'm not reading all these documents to you. Just hit pause, you know, to read it. You know, I'm trying to more about, you know, my game plan here. I don't want the video to be two hours long either. So he, there is my second document for bucket two. A Turkish ruler converted to Christianity after being rescued by a saint during a snowstorm. Now, this is where you got to put your personal beliefs aside. Religion is a very personal thing for people. You know, regardless of if you're religious or not, or what religion you belong to, you're agnostic, you're an atheist, that's your choice. When you're doing this, you got to use what's in the document. Okay, so you might be, you know, depending on your background or what your beliefs are, you know, I totally understand if you're looking at this like, you know, I'm in a snowstorm, but a saint came and because he's a king. So a saint comes to this king and says, you know, you're probably going to die. But uh, if you believe in Jesus, I'll, I'll get you out of the snowstorm. You know, it's like a Jesus tow truck. Now, if you find that to be a little, you know, a little out there, like, come on. That's a different conversation for a different class, right? Take theology. As far as we're concerned, we're using this document for our purposes. So just go with it. A Turkish ruler converted to Christianity after being rescued by a saint during a snowstorm. D6, I'm describing what's in the document. The author clearly wanted to show how Christianity is making life better for converts. There's my hip sheet. The author. The Turkish king agreed to be baptized. That's my second shot at describing the document. Therefore, follow my template, therefore, providing more historical evidence that the diffusion of religion, along with trade, was at a massive scale. Why did I say massive scale? I'm addressing the extent. This is what a lot of you guys didn't do. This is why I stopped grading Sunday and made this whole PowerPoint and now video. And we, I lectured on this today and yesterday. You guys keep describing the document over and over again like a good English paper. You guys are losing sight of what the point is. You're supposed to be telling me the extent. You guys are writing a bunch of stuff that's historically accurate, but you're not addressing the extent. Common mistakes, not just you guys, but along with trade was at a mass. I'm, I keep... Every document, I'm trying to show how my argument is that it was massive scale. It was big. It was global. I keep trying to drive that point home. In every single document, I want to show how this helps me support my claim. Like, a, like my lawyer in court would just be coming up with ways to prove and convince a jury that I acted in self-defense and I shouldn't be going to jail. You know, he goes over the, the laws in the state of Michigan. You know, hey, Mr. Cruz has a legally registered weapon, right? He didn't get this. This thing wasn't something. He didn't buy this out of somebody's trunk at Clark Park, right? This is a legally registered weapon. 
Um, it's his it's his legal legally obtained firearm. He's in his own home, his domicile. He was sleeping with his wife. It's three o'clock in the morning. This intruder came at him with a weapon, grabs his gun, self-defense. That is what my lawyer should be saying. He keeps making the argument that I acted in self-defense so I don't go to frickin' jail. He better not be up there telling the jury I like to make pasta. It's got nothing to do with anything. That's what you guys are doing. You keep you you, you keep writing stuff about the prompt. It's like you're over describing it. It's like you're describing it. You're describing the documents, but guess what? I'm wondering, did you even read the prompt? Did you forget about the prompt? Some of you guys, your your essays, it's like you forgot what the prompt was asking you. You're getting off topic. What extent? What's the extent? Now, does it sound repetitive? Yes. An English teacher would probably light me up. An English teacher would probably hate this essay. But I got a six, bro, because this ain't English. Now, guess what I did? I'm tired. I was making this PowerPoint. It was Sunday night. It's like 1130. My wife got mad at me. I canceled our pasta date because I had to finish this. I'm tired. So the day you take your test, hopefully you're not worried about pasta, but you're probably running out of time. So I'm like, you know what? I'm done. I quit. So I just stopped with body paragraph two. Here's my reasons why. Hit pause, read it. Because I got a six, bro. I'm not even trying to get a seven. I don't believe in unicorns. I'm not going to waste all that time. I'm not going to lose three points trying to get one point that I'm probably not going to get anyway. Remember last year, somebody on the college board told me only 1.8% of people that, that took the exam got the unicorn point. All right, here's the whole essay. It's not much. Most of our work is here in the first body paragraph. Here's my contextualization. There's my thesis. Very easy to tell. If you're, if you're my college board reader, don't you like that? I just made your job easier. You Man, before you read a word, you already know where my thesis is. You know where it starts. You know where it ends. You know where my contextualization is. I'm serving this thing up. I'm, you, you can tell what documents I'm sourcing because I labeled them for you, bro. I even labeled the evidence beyond the document just to help you make your life easier. Okay, read that. If you didn't copy this in class, copy it now. I want you to know what a six feels like. And notice how I keep tying it back to the prompt, back to the thesis, back to the prompt, back to the thesis. A little repetitive. It's clunky. This is not a pretty essay, but it ain't English class. I don't need pretty. It can be clunky. It's okay. I got a six. Do you think I got a six? You score it. You grade it. You tell me what you think. I'll talk to you in class.